Tonight, crisis at the border. Those are unlawful actions that are not helpful. The Department of Justice sues the state of Texas and Governor Greg Abbott after a major deadline passes as the administration demands action over the state's handling of migrants at the border. The message the governor is now sending to the White House and reaction from within his own party as the humanitarian crisis worsens. Plus, do you think of yourself as a hero? I don't like the word hero. It's a love story amid a devastating war. In tonight's Prime Focus, we bring you the story of a young soldier on his long road to recovery with his wife at his side. And you want to sell high end stuffed Himalayan cat. It was the cultural moment no one saw coming. We're with the directors of the new film tackling the fad that turned cute stuffed animals into major collector's items and a worldwide obsession in the beanie bubble. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including scorched earth. The last three weeks have been the hottest ever recorded in the world, with about 40 million people now under alert as the heat dome stretches into the middle of the country. We'll bring you that report and what the next few days will bring. Plus, the massive demonstrations erupting in Israel after Benjamin Netanyahu's bid to overhaul the judiciary there. And bye-bye, Birdie. Why Twitter and its famous bird may be gone for good as the social media giant goes through yet another overhaul. And Barbenheimer may have been the biggest thing to happen to movie theaters this year, but streaming is still leading, especially for children. We'll have what's driving massive streaming growth by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with the humanitarian emergency at our nation's border and the battle over the alleged mistreatment of migrants. The Department of Justice now suing the state of Texas over the floating buoy barrier installed in the middle of the Rio Grande last week. The lawsuit comes after Texas Texas Governor Abbott doubled down on his use of buoys to deter migrants and Texas's constitutional right of, quote, sovereign authority to protect its borders. Abbott bashing Biden, saying, Texas will see you in court, Mr. President, in a letter he sent to the Department of Justice. At the center of it all, migrants from the Americas and beyond coming to our southern border as sweltering summer temperatures surpass 100 degrees. We'll be joined by a Texas congressman who is trying to use bipartisan support to cut through the noise and hopes to simultaneously provide some reprieve for the migrants and our labor market as Mireya Villarreal is standing by in the congressman's district in the border town of Eagle Pass, Texas, where she filed this report for us tonight. Tonight, the Department of Justice following through with their threat to sue the state of Texas for installing this 1,000-foot buoy barrier to deter migrants from crossing. The lawsuit claiming Texas flouted federal law when it did not seek authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers prior to installing the floating barrier and demanding it be removed from the Rio Grande River. Texas Governor Greg Abbott refusing to remove the barrier, arguing in a letter sent to President Biden this morning, the state has the constitutional right and sovereign interest in protecting its borders, writing, Texas will see you in court, Mr. President. The White House responding to that letter moments before the lawsuit was filed. Instead of coming to the table and trying to figure out a way to work together, uh, he continues to do this really uh, cruel, uh, unjust, inhumane uh, ways of moving forward. Border crossings were already down more than 30 percent before the barrier was installed and since Title 42 expired and the Biden administration put stricter restrictions in place. The red buoy blockade placed in a shallow area of the river where it's easier to cross, forcing migrants to navigate deeper waters and later crawl through razor wire. ABC News obtaining gruesome photos showing some migrants' injuries. The issue coming to a head after an unnamed state trooper sent an email to a superior calling the buoys and wire nothing but an inhumane trap for migrants. And Mireya Villarreal joins us now. Mireya, you had some trouble finding that location to go live from because of this operation. Tell us what happened. 
Well, you know, Stephanie, we were looking for a live shot location. Uh, we actually have done several of our live shots from the park that you see behind me. It's called Shelby Park here in Eagle Pass. So we pulled up to the area and we were told we had to leave by Texas DPS troopers. They said that they have taken over much of the riverbank for this operation. And they said we couldn't be here because the park is now considered closed. We do know, however, that Mexico is also raising some red flags about the operation and this barrier saying that Texas is right now in violation of several international treaties. Amadea, I want you to stand by for us if you can. I want to bring in Texas Congressman Tony Gonzalez. Congressman, thank you so much for being here with us. I know you're working on trying to get some immigration legislation passed, but before we get into that, in Mireya's report, we played a, a portion of the White House's response today to Governor Abbott. I want to play a little more of that sound from the press, press secretary for you. Go ahead and take a listen. The only person, the one person that is sowing chaos is Governor Abbott. That's what he continues to do, political stunts in an inhumane way. Governor Abbott is making it harder for the men and women of the border can patrol by what he's doing. So what is your reaction, given that it was an email from a concerned trooper highlighting what he called inhumane? Is the governor making the jobs of people like that trooper harder and, and it, it's costing the lives of migrants? Uh, thank you for having me, Stephanie. Uh, the life of uh, agents is already pretty tough. I think America is tired of it's everybody's fault but uh, their own, but whether it's the White House blaming the states or whether it's the states blaming the White House, round and round we go with no solutions. I represent two thirds of the Texas-Mexico border, over 800 miles. This buoy is a quarter mile, so it's relatively small in comparison to the overall border, but it's the only thing we're talking about. And we're talking about that because no matter, no matter how much razor wire Governor Abbott puts out, he's not going to be able to secure the border because it's going to take President Biden enforcing the laws that are on the books and Congress updating those laws. So it really takes adults to sit down and come up with solutions. It's the reason why I introduced the Higher Act. It has a dozen Republicans, half a dozen Democrats. It focuses on legal pathways through work visas. Uh, right now, you're seeing a lot of politicians blaming everybody else, and they run this play over and over again. I don't have that luxury because I'm in a district where, where we're the ones that are at the forefront of this crisis. And you mentioned your district there. How dire is the situation for your constituents? It, it's really, it, it is dire, and it's really sad because it's predominantly Hispanic. Many people are first or second generation Americans. They're very uh, compassionate towards those that are seeking, uh, you know, a better life for themselves. But it also is very chaotic. And, and because of the border crisis, many of the schools, thankfully we're in summer right now, but many of the schools have gone into lockdown. Uvalde is also in my district. It, it, you know, schools go into lockdown three or four times a week. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of outsiders that have come and visited. No one knew where Eagle Pass was a few years ago. Now everyone's there every week. So it, everyone's really tired and they just want it to go away. They just want some sense of, of normalcy. The, the other part of it too is going back to the compassion part of it, nine out of 10 people seeking asylum aren't gonna qualify for asylum because they are here for economic purposes. It's the reason why I've tried to focus on work visas. People that wanna come over, live the American dream, we, we vet them, we know who they are, make sure they're not terrorists, make sure they're not uh, smuggling things. And then we, we match them up with employers. Here in the United States, we have vacancies in every single job, in, several, in industry. This is an area that the president is missing an opportunity, Congress is missing an opportunity, but it's gonna take political boldness in order to bring this country together. Now you bring up the Higher Act. Would these H-2 visas eventually lead to citizenship? I think it's a good start. I mean, basically what it does is instead of going through a river and making this dangerous trek, you know, what if you there was a legal route where you could come in the light and not be folk, be forced to be smuggled in a train or have to take these this dangerous trek that so many are getting injured. And what it would also do is alleviate some stress for employees here, uh, employers here in the United States. You know, right now, if you're if you're tired of waiting 30 minutes for a beer, you know, this bill can help you. 
If you're tired of, of waiting two weeks to see a doctor because there's a lack of nurses in your clinic or hospital, this bill can help you. So it's one of those things where I think it starts to get us to walk down that route. The biggest issue, let's get Congress to work again. It has to be bipartisan. It has to be, it can't be a Republican issue or a Democrat issue or it's the president's fault or it's the governor's fault. How about we just solve the problem by coming together in something sensible and work visas, I think, is that is that sweet spot. Congressman, before I let you go, I want to bring back our Mireya Villarreal, who is in Eagle Pass, which is actually your district. Mireya, you have a question for the congressman? I do. Thank you so much for joining us. I do want to say that uh, we've spoken to a number of residents that live here in Eagle Pass, business owners. They say that their backyard looks like a war zone, and they say that tactics like this um, make a mockery of their culture here, and they are asking uh, for you to do something. What realistically can you do now, and how do you respond to those people? Look, in my district, if you ask 10 people, five will say build a wall 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet, and the other five will say I don't want an, a wall at all. Welcome to uh, Texas's 23rd district. I think it, what it, essentially what people want is the chaos to end. They want law and order to be enforced, but they also don't want to see people be treated uh, poorly. So the number one thing is this. The president of the United States need to, needs to enforce the laws that are on the books, and Congress needs to take bold action and solve this through legal routes. Stop encouraging people to come over illegally. It's a heavy lift. I mean, there's a reason why immigration reform hasn't been uh, successful in decades, but it's going to take those bold leaders that, that are willing to go outside the box and really view it through the lens of a bipartisan solution. It's why I'm so excited about this Higher Act. It's got 40 outside endorsees to include the Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Farm Bureau, and several different immigration advocacy groups as well. It's a start, but I think it's going to take more solutions and less rhetoric. Congressman Gonzalez, we will keep a close eye on what you're doing to, to better the situation. Mireya Villarreal, thank you so much. And Congressman, thank you, too, uh, for being here and speaking on this. Very important information. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Now to the latest on the deadly heat wave gripping much of the U.S. That heat dome is expanding to the Midwest, spreading the sweltering summer temperatures north and east. While in Phoenix, it's the city's 25th straight day of temperatures reaching 110 degrees or more. The low there hasn't dropped below 90 degrees for the past 15 days. ABC's Mola Lenghi has more from Arizona. Tonight, that dangerous extreme heat now taking aim at the Midwest and east. Triple-digit heat indexes now in the forecast as far north as Minnesota and South Dakota. Wednesday and Thursday, heat index values expected to go up above 100, air temperatures in the upper 90s. Meanwhile, the southwest continues to swelter. Phoenix now hitting 110 or higher for 25 straight days. Las Vegas officially tying their record of 10 consecutive days at or above 110 degrees. It's taking a toll on everything from air conditioners. In the last seven days, we did 63 calls. To vehicles. More car repairs with uh, radiators and air conditioning and overheated tires. Outside Las Vegas, authorities say two women died while on a hike in Valley of Fire State Park, where it was 114 degrees on Saturday. And two other female hikers in distress had to be airlifted from the hills above Los Angeles in serious condition, temperatures in the mid-90s. Each year, heat killing more people on average than any other type of extreme weather. Well, the burn center here at Valley Wise Health Hospital in Phoenix is completely full. A third of the patients who are checked in here are here for contact burns after falling onto the asphalt. That's how hot the ground has been here recently. Doctors telling me the conditions they are seeing outside right now are the most dangerous they've ever seen here, Stephanie. Let's get right to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano with a question on everyone's mind. Rob, how much longer is this going to last? Well, as far as the heat is concerned, Stephanie, we're looking at it to continue through at least the end of the month. And July likely to go down as the warmest uh, month on record globally. Uh, and then we're seeing storms also roll over the top of this heat ridge here in the U.S. So we've got severe thunderstorm watches up tonight here in New England and New York and parts of the Ohio River Valley. And some of these storms you see on the radar, they've had winds of 60 plus miles per hour. So that's enough to do some damage and maybe take down some power lines. So be aware of that tonight. And then if you live in the zone and then that cluster in Louisville will, will roll into the northeast from D.C. Philly up through New York by uh, rush hour tomorrow, 
Some heavy rain might see some severe weather out of that one too. And here's that heat we just can't get rid of. The warnings continue in the southwest. Now it's building into the Midwest and the upper Midwest where temperatures measured in the shade without humidity will be over 100 in Oklahoma City, Dodge City, Topeka, Pier, uh, South Dakota tomorrow. And then extending Wednesday, Thursday, you're going to build it into Minneapolis to near maybe over 100 degrees there in Wichita, Kansas. And some of this heat and humidity will get here in the northeast by week's end. Stephanie? Just an incredible amount of heat. Thanks so much, Rob. Scorching temperatures in Greece are fueling the wildfires raging across much of that country. These satellite images collected just this morning show the fires burning across the island of Rhodes where tens of thousands of people have already been evacuated and there is no end in sight. ABC's Marcus Moore is there with the latest. Tonight, dozens of new wildfires breaking out across Greece as Europe swelters in an unprecedented heat wave. On the island of Rhodes, vacationers fleeing fires on tour buses as helicopters try to douse the flames nearby. It's very, very bad, the situation. We need help. Send us help from everywhere. Coast Guard vessels ferrying nearly 20,000 tourists and residents to shelters in safer parts of the island where they sprawled out on cots trying to stay cool in the heat. Hundreds more sleeping on airport floors trying to get out. Hell on earth. Um, never thought I'd be caught up in something like that. We were with firefighters near Evia, Greece's second largest island, racing to stop the flames feeding on these hills. It's never-ending work, and it's been going on for the better part of a week here. And this is, appears to be one of the lines of a fire that's been burning this afternoon. They've been able to get ahead of it. You see the white smoke there. But it seems that whenever they put one fire out, another one flares back up. Officials say the evacuation effort is the largest operation of its kind in the country's history. And Stephanie, these fires just are not stopping. I want you to look at this, those flames off in the distance, still burning and threatening the small village where we are. And the hot, dry, windy conditions are expected to persist through at least the end of the week, meaning this could be another sleepless night for those firefighters who are battling to protect property and save lives. Stephanie. Marcus Moore for us in Greece. Thank you so much for that update, Marcus. Back here in the U.S., a police officer in Ohio is under investigation for ordering a canine to attack an unarmed man who had already surrendered following a chase through three counties. The suspect reportedly called 911 during the pursuit, saying he was afraid to pull over. We do want to warn you that the video is disturbing for some viewers. Here's ABC's Alex Perche with that story from Ohio. Do not release the dog. Tonight, a canine officer is under investigation and on paid leave after he appeared to command his dog to attack this unarmed black truck driver following a chase in Ohio. In body cam footage, a state trooper repeatedly warns an assisting local police officer not to release his dog on the man whose hands are up. Do not release the dog with his hands up. But that officer appears to signal for the dog to attack. Get the dog off of it! The 23-year-old driver, Jadarius Rose, given first aid and arrested. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Oh, Just let a dog bite you. And the trooper who warned against using the dog, baffled. Was that not loud enough? You said it three, four like months of time. Authorities say it all started when the driver failed to pull over for a missing mud flap. Troopers chasing that semi for 26 miles, at one point ordering the driver out of the truck at gunpoint before he takes off again calling 911, telling a dispatcher he doesn't feel safe. I was about to comply with them, but they all uh, had their guns drawn out for whatever reason. You need to pull over. You're going to get yourself in more trouble than what you're already in. I haven't even did, but I don't know why they're trying to kill me. Today, Circleville's mayor telling us that canine officer Ryan Speakman is now facing a review. It's an unfortunate situation, and we look to get it resolved very, very soon. The local NAACP saying that attack brought back horrible memories of dogs used on civil rights activists. It saddens me that in 2023, we have officers who are unleashing dogs. Alex Perche for us from Ohio, thank you. Massive protests are raging in the streets of Israel where tens of thousands of demonstrators are furious over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's court reform plan passed by Israeli lawmakers today. The plan severely limits the Supreme Court's power to review government decisions with critics saying it threatens the country's democracy. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge has the latest from Jerusalem. <laughs> Tonight, the battle for Israel's future boiling over. Protesters blocking roads, police firing water cannons. This driver plowing into demonstrators, injuring three people. 
Earlier, the Israeli government pushing through a controversial new law, scrapping the Supreme Court's ability to strike down government decisions which judges deem unreasonable. For these protesters, today's vote is an attack on Israeli democracy. There's anger, there's despair, but they say they'll fight on. Mother of two, Gali, served in the army. I feel like I lost my country. I'm scared for my children's future. Inside the parliament, opposition politicians facing inevitable defeat, boycotting the vote, chanting shame as they walked out. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seen smiling in the Knesset as his hard-right coalition passed the bill. And tonight, Netanyahu addressing the nation, saying the law will actually strengthen democracy because a government elected by a majority of Israelis would be freer to act. Tom Sufi Burridge joins me now from Jerusalem. And Tom, what's the White House's response to this critical vote tonight? Yes, Stephanie, tonight the White House saying it was, quote, unfortunate that the bill passed with the slimmest possible majority. And in an unprecedented move, thousands of Israeli army reservists have threatened they will refuse to serve. Stephanie? Tom Sufi Burridge for us. Thank you so much for that update. There is word tonight that police have recovered the body of a missing paddle boarder on Martha's Vineyard, who we've learned worked as a chef for former President Obama. Police say divers found Tafari Campbell about 100 feet from shore in Edgartown Great Pond, where he was visiting. Mr. and Mrs. Obama, who were not at Martha's Vineyard at the time, released a statement calling him a warm, fun, extraordinarily kind person. There is still much more to get to here on Prime. A deadly bear attack inside Yellowstone National Park. What we're learning about the woman who lost her life. And up next, in our Prime Focus, overcoming the wounds of war. He lost his arms and sight fighting for Ukraine, but his wife's dedication has never faltered. How their love is staying strong amid his recovery battle. And what was it like when you, when you saw him for the first time? happy that I am with him, that he's not alone, that I am not alone too, that we are together because we are family. Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The devastation from the war in Ukraine has hit home for so many citizens there. And one 27-year-old Ukrainian fighting on the front lines has suffered devastating injuries in an explosion. But with his wife by his side for every moment of his recovery, their love has endured. ABC's James Longman has their story in tonight's prime focus. And we do warn you that some of the images may be difficult to watch. 
I'm at a military hospital in central Kyiv to meet Andriy and Alina Smolensky. Andriy, what would you like? There you go. Yeah. Andriy lost both arms and his sight fighting for his country in the spring. His recovery has been long, but for every step, his wife Alina has been by his side. The first thing I have to say is when I'm sitting in front of you, you haven't stopped touching. You're so close. <laughs> The couple met five years ago. They were just 22, but Andre knew that Alina was the girl for him. We were talking and talking and talking, and I, I just loved it, you know. They were married after just three months and settled into life together. But when the war came, Andre didn't hesitate to sign up. I have a great career. Uh, I have my home. I have my lovely wife. Uh, I have my hopes and dreams for my future too, you know. There is so much I love here. So I really need to protect it. That's it. What was your feeling when he went off to war? Uh, of course, uh, I was scared uh, a lot. He can't, you couldn't change his mind? Yeah, I, I couldn't change his did you mind. Want, did you want to change his mind? No. <laughs> uh, I, I love him uh, as uh, he, he is. <laughs> so uh, if uh, he... Uh, uh, if he was another person, uh, if he had uh, another mind, uh, I don't know if uh, I'd, I'd love him. After a brief time in the infantry around Bakhmut, Andri was reassigned to a reconnaissance drone unit. He was promoted to sergeant, but one day in the trenches, monitoring Russian troop movements, he became the target himself. Uh, after I start, like, taking out from the trench to take the UAV, basically, this is the last moment I remember. Like, I just get out from the trench like that. And uh, my partner, he thought I'm, I was dead. Because it uh, got blown right next to my head and my hands. Because I get out from the trench. I see, so you reached out from the trench towards the drone. Yeah. yeah. And in that moment, there was a mine there. I get conscious at mm -hmm. the moment. And also start shouting, like, hey, like A R, like much practical. <laughs> get the car. Like you were shouting car. orders. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. didn't know what a mine essentially exploded in your face. Yeah, kind and of. And you were still Punched. shouting orders yeah. at your man. Yeah. yeah, I was shouting orders all the time. Back in Kiev, Alina was receiving the terrible news. Uh, it was uh, a military psychologist. Uh, he asked me to sit down and uh, um, he, he said that there are two news for me and uh, um, <sighs> the good news is that Andre is uh, alive and uh, the sad news uh, is that he doesn't have uh, his arms and uh, uh, he didn't know if uh, uh, he, uh, he had his eyes. It was devastating to hear, and Alina broke down. But then her practical side kicked in. She packed her stuff in 15 minutes and traveled to be with her husband. Mm. You just couldn't wait to get to him. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And what was it like when you, when you saw him for the first time? You know, I felt happy that I'm with him, that he's not alone, that I am not alone too, that we are together, because mm -hmm. we are family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really happy to be with him. But <laughs> it's okay. Doctors were rushing to save Andrei's life. Alina could only watch. Who taught you to be this strong? <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing for you to say, I'm grateful to be with him in that moment. That's very generous, <laughs> you know? Maybe. <laughs> Where did yeah. you learn this? I don't know. I don't know. I just love my husband mm. and uh, I appreciate every moment uh, I can be with him. To be honest, my heart is shrinking this time I hear um, the story from Elena. Like, I, I feel really bad for that because I feel my 
responsibility for uh, the way I come. I came back from the war. I, I, I don't upset of what I did. I don't want to change my past, you know. But at the same time, I'm really grateful to the God, basically, that I'm alive and that I'm sane because all the shrapnel went to my face. Like this, something you see now is a hard work for doctors, like a huge team that restore piece by piece all my face, my eyes, my mouth, my nose, and everything. And what does it mean to you to have Alina? It's everything for me. Like, I'm not sure that I would be that strong now <laughs> if I didn't have my wife with me all this time. Doctors come in to apply fresh bandages. Every day, Andri is learning to adapt to his new life. Alina films these doctors at work. She's also learning how to help him. But Andri does have moments of sadness, the realization he will likely never see again. When uh, I realized that my whole life disappearing now, and my dreams disappearing now, my career disappearing now, and the next time I'm gonna come to Karpatia Mountains, hiking with my wife, I won't have possibility to take her hand and see her smiling. And that was something really hard for me. Do you think of your, I think I know the answer to this question, but do you think of yourself as a hero? I, for all my life, I did what I think is right. I don't like the word hero. Do you think he's a hero? What is the, the definition of the word hero? <laughs> Someone who does something heroic, which mm -hmm. is bigger than himself, maybe. Uh, all the time I know him. He tried to do what is better for, for all the people, people around the world. And uh, he tried to uh, do something great in his life. I think maybe, maybe it's okay for a definition of the word hero. <laughs> you have that way that you, many Ukrainians have this strength where they don't think any, anything they do is special. They just think, well, it's just life. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but everyone, let me tell you now, uh, everyone watching will think you are very special. And they'll think you're even more special because you don't think it yourself. <laughs> you know, everyone uh, told me that, Alina, you are so strong. Uh, you are doing uh, such a lot of things, but uh, what I'm thinking about me, I don't think that uh, I do something special. That's my husband, I love him. What else should I do? No, <laughs> that's okay for me. That's not something uh, heroic or uh, exceptional <laughs> for me. Now, Stephanie, Alina and Andre, just an extraordinary couple. It was such an honour to meet them. They are hoping for some kind of intervention from abroad, perhaps new technologies around prosthetics, hoping even, perhaps, to restore Andre's sight. But for the moment, they've got each other. Stephanie? They certainly do. What a difficult and emotional journey they've been on, but they have each other. We'd like to thank James Longman and our international team for that report and covering the day in and day out there in Ukraine. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. A robbery aboard a yacht. The celebrity police say was on the vessel at the time. And a message from Jamie Foxx on his recent health battle, what he says he didn't want fans to see. But up next, Barbie and Oppenheimer, maybe all the rage, but streaming platforms hit their highest levels ever this summer. We take a look at the age group fueling the increase by the numbers. So much.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! Somebody if I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. For many, summer means outside games, beach trips, and screen time. Nielsen Research reports that streaming platforms hit their highest level in June. Here's a look by the numbers. 37.7% of all TV use in June was streaming. That's the highest since Nielsen began tracking such things in 2021, and a 1.3% increase from May. Other TV uses like video game consoles and playing DVDs or Blu-rays, people are still doing that. That increased more than 1% as well, while cable TV fell by half a point and broadcast networks lost 2%. What happened? Well, school is out. Kids ages 2 to 11 increased their TV use by 16%, while the 12 to 17 age group used 24% more TV time. Young TV users spent more than 90% of their increased screen time on streaming and video games rather than cable or broadcast programs. Seven different streaming platforms hit monthly highs in June. The big winners, YouTube and Netflix, both rose by two-tenths of a percent. So if your young ones in your life seem to be spending their summer with eyes glued to the tube, do not worry, they're not alone. 
mine are as well. And much more ahead here on Prime, raising the alarm on a rising number of cancer cases in young people. What doctors are saying about the increase. It was once an American phenomenon, and now the rapid rise and fall of Beanie Babies is being turned into a film. We spoke to the directors of The Beanie Bubble. And an unlikely weekend pairing, how Barbie and Oppenheimer fans joined forces to create a record-shattering weekend. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A deadly grizzly bear attack inside of a national park. The celebrity on board a yacht during a reported robbery and an expected box office battle turns into a record-breaking team effort. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. A woman found dead of an apparent grizzly bear attack has been identified. She's 47-year-old Amy Adamson of Derby, Kansas, her mother speaking to ABC News. Every morning she'd get up early and she'd walk, hike, or run. She died doing what she loved. Adamson's body found on a trail west of Yellowstone National Park. 
A heavy police presence caught on camera after a reported robbery on board a yacht in Miami. According to a Miami Beach police report, rapper Quavo was among those on the yacht when the boat's captain says they were told time was running out and it needed to be returned. Police say two other men on the boat threatened the captain and then took his wallet. Police detained multiple people, but no arrests were made. An investigation remains ongoing. Several communities across the country gripped by tragedy. Authorities say 17-year-old high school student and star athlete Sadie Morrow was killed Saturday night in a crash on Cape Cod after the boat she was in hit a jetty, sending her and five others into the water. In South Carolina, the 11-year-old daughter of a former Major League Soccer goalie died after the boat carrying her family was rocked by the wake from another boat. And in Missouri, this staggering aftermath after officials say eight people were severely injured in the Ozarks when an intoxicated boat driver collided into this lakefront home. A sweeping rebrand now underway at Twitter. Elon Musk announcing yesterday the social media app is scrapping the bird logo in favor of a black X. The X started appearing on desktop versions of Twitter this morning. Musk says soon all of Twitter's bird logos will be phased out on the smartphone app. Twitter CEO says the rebrand is part of efforts to redefine the social network. Doctors are sounding the alarm about cancer diagnoses on the rise in people younger than 50. Colorectal cancer has seen more than a 46% increase in early onset cases from 2000 to 2019. We actually don't know what is driving this uptick. All cancers are on the rise nearly 13%, with notable upticks in diagnoses for breast cancer and stomach cancer. One study found eight of the 14 cancers under review were in the digestive system, suggesting diet and lifestyle might be playing a part in young people's diagnoses. Barbie is dancing its way to a box office blowout. Barbie in the real world. That's impossible. The film shattering records with 155 million in ticket sales opening weekend, helping bring the biggest box office revenues since 2019. This is a national emergency. The highly anticipated drama Oppenheimer also shattering expectations, raking in 80 million. Together, Barbenheimer bringing the fourth biggest box office weekend in history. Now Mattel is already working on bringing other childhood favorites to the big screen, including Hot Wheels, Polly Pockets, and Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Now, after months of questions and unverified reports, Oscar winner Jamie Foxx speaking to fans directly for the first time about his medical scare and his recovery. ABC's DeMarco Morgan has the details. Celebrities and fans alike reacting to actor and comedian Jamie Foxx speaking out over the weekend for the first time since being hospitalized for a serious medical incident. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody that's prayed, man, and sent me messages. I cannot even begin to tell you um, how, how far it took me and how, how it brought me back. Fox getting emotional and personal on his Instagram page. I went through something that I, I thought I would never, ever go through. It was back in April when Fox, according to his daughter, Corinne, experienced a medical complication while on the set of Back in Action in Atlanta. The film taking a pause in production after he was rushed to the hospital. I just didn't want you to see me like that, man. You know, I want you to see me laughing, having a good time, partying, cracking a joke, doing a movie, television show. I didn't want you to see me with, uh, with tubes uh, running out of me and, and trying to figure out uh, if, if I was going to make it through. It was a mess The reactor even using his humor at one point to address rumors and gossip about what led up to his hospitalization. Now, you know, by being quiet, sometimes things, you know, get out of hand. People saying what I got. Some people said I was I was blind. But as you can see, uh, as you can see, the eyes are working. The eyes are working just fine. Uh, I said I was paralyzed. I'm not paralyzed. Uh, but I did go through. I went to hell and back. 
Hollywood wasting no time reacting to the star's heartfelt message. Queen Latifah commenting, this is the moment I've been waiting for, for you to be able to speak these words for yourself. LeBron James writing, God continue to bless you, my brother. Happy as hell, you're doing better and looking good, champ. Can't wait to see you again. I just want to like say uh, I, that, I, that I, I love everybody and I love all of the love that I got. So glad that he is doing well and still has his sense of humor. Our thanks to DeMarco Morgan. Time tonight for the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we talk to the creators behind some of the biggest films and TV series. It's a craze many of us remember, me included, small stuffed animals turned collectibles that came in all shapes and sizes, Beanie Babies. Remember those? Now, decades after the wildly popular toy catapulted to fame, the comedy drama The Beanie Bubble tells the story of designer and manufacturer Ty Warner. But the real center pieces of the film is a trio of women, strong women. Our Diane Macedo sat down with directors Kristen Gore and Damien Coulash to talk about the business of comedy and the strikes happening right now in Hollywood. You want to sell high-end stuffed Himalayan cats. Understuffed, actually, for a greater possibility. We're professionals. We're giving the people what they need. Kristen, Damien, thank you both so much for coming on. I have so many questions about this movie, but the first one, there are so many toys that have become all the rage in these crazy collectibles over the years. Why tell the story of the Beanie Baby? Well, we were really uh, drawn to the women's stories behind the craze, actually. We uh, read this book that Zach Bissonette wrote that came out in 2015, and we couldn't believe the story behind this phenomenon. Then this book really opened our eyes to how uh, insane this tale of like one of the wildest speculative crazes in history came to be. And then these three women who had so much to do with the phenomenon, their stories were incredibly compelling to us and we, that's, that we were hooked by that. Now you've said that you knew right off the bat that Zach Galifianakis would be perfect to play Ty Warner. Why is that? Hmm. Well, because he's so lovable even when he's doing terrible things. And you have to sort of love him even while you're seeing these terrible things. Um, and that's exactly what Zach can do. He's such a wonderful person in real life that when he's in his comedy, when he's being so terrible, you still love him. This has always been my company. Company we created together. Why do you have to be so dramatic? I mean... My salary's been reduced 75%. Yeah, I'm just doing what's necessary, you know, running the real actual business over here. Now, you've said that it was important to have strong women carry this story. Why was that and how did you go about making sure that that happened in this film? Well, the characters are so compelling and we wanted to do them justice. I mean, we have Robbie in our film who started the company with Ty and we have Sheila whose daughter is directly inspired the Beanie Babies and we have Maya who is an internet genius and one of the first innovators of online marketing and took the company from millions to billions and she was 19 when she started working at Ty and so they all are incredibly strong in different ways. We knew um, Elizabeth Banks has so many of Robbie's characteristics. She's she's so ambitious, driven, ambitious, smart, smart feisty, self-made. And Sarah um, Snook is like the perfect strong, strong mother. The Sheila character in our film has to is is really the sort of soul of the film in terms of like her her morals never stray. She's the moral compass. She's the moral yes. compass, and and we wanted to make sure she's presented as as strong or stronger than all the other women, that she's like, really? she's got, she knows exactly what she wants from the beginning and you do not want to mess with her. I am not joking. And then Geraldine just lights up everything. I mean, she's so warm and authentic. She's really real and she's, the I feel like. The enthusiasm for the world that bubbles out of her is exactly what we needed for this character. Right. And the sort of like pokey sarcasm. She's punky, but she's optimistic. And that is Geraldine. So we super lucked out with our cast. We were thrilled to be able to get, get to work with them. So talk to me about the Beanie Babies themselves. I heard you guys created thousands of your own stuffed animals for this, your own Beanie Babies for this. Walk me through that. We did. We did, yeah. I mean, when you're making a film um, that is centered around a product, y you don't actually want to use the real product because then you have to get permission for everything. So yeah. we made our own little plush toys. 10,000 of them. <laughs> yeah. We made 10,000 Beanie Babies. We did, and it actually was, there was 
there were supply chain problems. It was hard to get them in time for the movie, and our producer had a big emergency set meeting right before production, was, and she held up one of the little, you know, fake beanies that we were making and said, if, if this is not on set by the time we're shooting, it's like Tom Cruise not showing up to work <laughs> on Mission Impossible on the first day of shooting. We need these here. The Luckily. opening shot of the, of the film is a truck crashing and 10,000 beanie babies flying in slow motion through the air, and we had to create every single one of them. So I want to go behind the scenes a little bit, because people watching may not know you were co-directors, but you were also husband and wife. So how is it directing this movie together, especially it being your first feature-length film? It's amazing to have a partner when you're directing. And our brains work almost exactly opposite one another. <laughs> yeah. We think about everything completely differently, but we agree on almost everything. What do you hope viewers take away from this film? This story was so important to you, so what do you want the end result to be? We'd love for it to be a sort of a, a wild, fun ride that gets at some meaningful exploration of the female relationship to the American dream and kind of le looks at what we value, why we value what we do, um, and also spreads joy. It was really important to us to make a film that brings some happiness while still getting at meaningful themes that matter to us. Before I let you guys go, I want to ask you about the writers and actors strike. What are your thoughts about what's going on in Hollywood right now? Well, we're in full support and solidarity with the Writers Guild and with SAG, um, been on the picket lines. It's much needed. Like, the, the system is very, very broken right now, and this it appears to be the only way to force it to fix itself. There are a lot of people saying, oh, millionaires aren't satisfied. Talk us through, what does it look like behind the scenes to you, and what do you think people are missing when they, when they look at that story? Oh, the vast majority are, are working actors who are <laughs> nowhere close to billionaires. And on the, for the, on the writer's side, I'm a member of the Writers Guild and, you know, have been on the picket lines. And it's uh, been a complete upending of a system that was fair and helped writers be able to make a living. It's totally changed in the last 10 years. So how do you expect to see this play out and what are you watching for as it goes on? We just hope that um, the the studios come to the table and make a fair deal for the writers and the actors, you know, and, and treat humans with uh, worth and value <laughs> and honor their contributions. The, I think the underlying this, um, the, the big problem here is that studios aren't what they used to be. These days, none of the studios have the same business model. Apple is not the same business model as Netflix, and Netflix is not the same business model as, as Warner. Kristen, Damien, it was so nice to talk to you today. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Our thanks to Diane Macedo. The Beanie Bubble is out now in select theaters and will stream on Apple TV Plus on July 28th. And finally tonight, a little music for a good cause. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet. Yep, that was me at Fenway Park this weekend. For the record, I just want to say I did not add this to the show myself, but this all was for a very good cause, so we must share. I'm an Army Reservist. I had the honor of singing God Bless America on behalf of HomeBase.org following their annual run to Home Base event this weekend. Such a wonderful time, such great energy there. The organization is dedicated to healing the invisible wounds of war for veterans and their families following their return from combat. More than 30,000 veterans have been helped, assisted by this organization, and their families couldn't be more grateful for their support. I am as well. What an honor to be there on their behalf. That is our show for this hour. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's tough stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
up in the next hour. It was once home to a thriving downtown area in tree-lined neighborhoods. Now much of it is gone. The slow recovery in Rolling Fork, Mississippi after a devastating tornado. And fined and forcibly removed by police. The latest legal battles for a renowned environmental activist and the vow she's making. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Stephanie Ramos, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to here this evening, including the lawsuit the Biden administration just filed against the governor of Texas over the state's mistreatment of migrants, plus the unrelenting heat taking a hold on the world. From record-setting temperatures here in the U.S. to unprecedented wildfires driving out thousands in Greece and rebuilding their community months after the storm. Our Robin Roberts is in Rolling Fork, Mississippi as the town tries to move forward following those devastating tornadoes this spring. But we begin with the humanitarian emergency at our nation's border and the battle over the alleged mistreatment of migrants. The Department of Justice now suing the state of Texas over the floating buoy barrier installed in the middle of the Rio Grande last week. There it is. The lawsuit comes after Texas Governor Abbott doubled down on his use of buoys to deter migrants and Texas's constitutional right of, quote, sovereign authority to protect its borders. Abbott bashing Biden, saying Texas will see you in court, Mr. President, in a letter he sent to the Department of Justice. At the center of it all, migrants from the Americas and beyond coming to our southern border as sweltering summer temperatures surpass 100 degrees. And it's from the border town of Eagle Pass, Texas, where our Mireya Villarreal leads us off tonight. Tonight, the Department of Justice following through with their threat to sue the state of Texas for installing this 1,000-foot buoy barrier to deter migrants from crossing. The lawsuit claiming Texas flouted federal law when it did not seek authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers prior to installing the floating barrier and demanding it be removed from the Rio Grande River. Texas Governor Greg Abbott refusing to remove the barrier, arguing in a letter sent to President Biden this morning, the state has the constitutional right and sovereign interest in protecting its borders, writing, Texas will see you in court, Mr. President. 
The White House responding to that letter moments before the lawsuit was filed. Instead of coming to the table and trying to figure out a way to work together, uh, he continues to do this really uh, cruel, uh, unjust, inhumane uh, ways of moving forward. Border crossings were already down more than 30 percent before the barrier was installed. And since Title 42 expired and the Biden administration put stricter restrictions in place, the red buoy blockade placed in a shallow area of the river where it's easier to cross, forcing migrants to navigate deeper waters and later crawl through razor wire. ABC News obtaining gruesome photos showing some migrants' injuries. The issue coming to a head after an unnamed state trooper sent an email to a superior calling the buoys and wire nothing but an inhumane trap for migrants. Our thanks to Mireya for that report. Now to the latest on the deadly heat wave gripping much of the U.S. That heat dome is expanding to the Midwest, spreading the sweltering summer temperatures north and east. While in Phoenix, it's the city's 25th straight day of temperatures reaching 110 degrees or more. The low there hasn't dropped below 90 degrees for the past 15 days. ABC's Mola Lenghi is there now. Tonight, that dangerous extreme heat now taking aim at the Midwest and East. Triple digit heat indexes now in the forecast as far north as Minnesota and South Dakota. Wednesday and Thursday, heat index values expected to go up above 100, air temperatures in the upper 90s. Meanwhile, the Southwest continues to swelter. Phoenix now hitting 110 or higher for 25 straight days. Las Vegas officially tying their record of 10 consecutive days at or above 110 degrees. It's taking a toll on everything from air conditioners. In the last seven days, we did 63 calls. To vehicles. More car repairs with uh, radiators and air conditioning and overheated tires. Outside Las Vegas, authorities say two women died while on a hike in Valley of Fire State Park, where it was 114 degrees on Saturday. And two other female hikers in distress had to be airlifted from the hills above Los Angeles in serious condition, temperatures in the mid-90s. Each year, heat killing more people on average than any other type of extreme weather. Well, the burn center here at Valley Wise Health Hospital in Phoenix is completely full. A third of the patients who are checked in here are here for contact burns after falling onto the asphalt. That's how hot the ground has been here recently. Doctors telling me the conditions they are seeing outside right now are the most dangerous they've ever seen here, Stephanie. Our thanks to Mola. Let's get right to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano with a question on everyone's mind. Rob, how much longer is this going to last? Well, as far as the heat is concerned, Stephanie, we're looking at it to continue through at least the end of the month. And July likely to go down as the warmest uh, month on record globally. Uh, and then we're seeing storms also roll over the top of this heat ridge here in the U.S. So we've got severe thunderstorm watches up tonight here in New England and New York and parts of the Ohio River Valley. And some of these storms you see on the radar, they've had winds of 60 plus miles per hour. So that's enough to do some damage and maybe take down some power lines. So be aware of that tonight. And then if you live in the zone and then that cluster in Louisville will, will roll into the northeast from D.C. Philly up through New York by uh, rush hour tomorrow. Some heavy rain might see some severe weather out of that one, too. And here's that heat we just can't get rid of. The warnings continue in the southwest. Now it's building into the Midwest and the upper Midwest, where temperatures measured in the shade without humidity will be over 100 in Oklahoma City, Dodge City, Topeka, Pier, uh, South Dakota tomorrow. And then extending Wednesday, Thursday, you're going to build it into Minneapolis to near maybe over 100 degrees there in Wichita, Kansas. And some of this heat and humidity will get here in the northeast by week's end. Stephanie? Just an incredible amount of heat. Thanks so much, Rob. Scorching temperatures in Greece are fueling the wildfires raging across much of that country. These satellite images collected just this morning show the fires burning across the island of Rhodes, where tens of thousands of people have already been evacuated, and there is no end in sight. ABC's Marcus Moore is there with the latest. Tonight, dozens of new wildfires breaking out across Greece as Europe swelters in an unprecedented heat wave. On the island of Rhodes, vacationers fleeing fires on tour buses as helicopters try to douse the flames nearby. It's very, very bad, the situation. We need help. Send us help from everywhere. Coast Guard vessels ferrying nearly 20,000 tourists and residents to shelters in safer parts of the island where they sprawled out on cots trying to stay cool in the heat. 
Hundreds more sleeping on airport floors trying to get out. Hell on earth. Um, never thought I'd be caught up in something like that. We were with firefighters near Evia, Greece's second largest island, racing to stop the flames feeding on these hills. It's never-ending work, and it's been going on for the better part of a week here. And this is, appears to be one of the lines of a fire that's been burning this afternoon. They've been able to get ahead of it. You see the white smoke there. But it seems that whenever they put one fire out, another one flares back up. Officials say the evacuation effort is the largest operation of its kind in the country's history. And Stephanie, these fires just are not stopping. I want you to look at this, those flames off in the distance, still burning and threatening the small village where we are. And the hot, dry, windy conditions are expected to persist through at least the end of the week, meaning this could be another sleepless night for those firefighters who are battling to protect property and save lives. Stephanie. Marcus Moore for us in Greece. Thank you so much. To the war in Ukraine now, where tonight Russia is blaming Ukraine for a new drone attack on Moscow, which they say damaged a high-rise building. And one drone was reportedly shot down near Defense Ministry headquarters. Here's ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman in Kyiv. Stephanie, Russia is accusing Ukraine of launching new drone attacks on Moscow. In one, a high-rise building was struck. A second drone fell near the defense ministry in the early hours of the morning. Now, Ukraine hasn't taken responsibility for this, but they have said that Russia was less and less able to defend its skies, saying, quote, whatever happens, there'll be more of it. And overnight, Russia has launched strikes on grain infrastructure right on NATO's border. About 15 drones were involved in an attack on the Ukrainian port town of Reni on the Danube. That is right across the river from Romania. Since withdrawing from the deal that allows grain to be shipped out of Ukraine, Russia has spent the past week relentlessly targeting grain exports. Stephanie? James, thank you so much for staying on top of that. The conflict in Sudan has officially reached its 100-day mark with no sign of coming to an end. According to the health minister, as of last month, the clashes have killed more than 3,000 people and wounded more than 6,000 others. The conflict derailed Sudanese hopes of restoring the country's fragile transition to democracy, which had begun after a popular uprising forced the military's removal of a longtime dictator in April of 2019. Now to the new developments in the Gilgo Beach serial killer investigation with a suspect accused of killing at least three women. Authorities are trying to confirm if any of them were murdered at his house. Police using a backhoe to dig up the backyard. Here's ABC's senior investigative reporter Aaron Kutursky. Tonight, the new images, investigators bringing heavy machinery onto this Long Island property as they work to determine whether Rex Heuerman killed any of his alleged victims at home. An excavator digging through his backyard, forensic technicians in white suits sifting through dirt, taking pictures, carting away evidence. So the, the question is, did he do, can we confirm that yeah. someone was killed inside the house? We can't confirm that this time. Authorities also deploying ground-penetrating radar that can detect anomalies underground to determine where they should dig. We're just doing a, a total investigation around the house to see if there's anything back there that we need to uh, take a closer look at. Inside the home Hewerman shared with his wife and children, police discovered what they described as a walk-in vault with a big iron door where Hewerman stored more than 200 guns. He has pleaded not guilty to charges he murdered three young women whose bodies were found at nearby Gilgo Beach in 2010. Authorities have said Hewerman's wife was out of town when each of the victims was discovered and was in the dark about her husband's alleged crimes. Neighbors are still in disbelief. The suspected serial killer lived on their quiet street. You know, the victims, their families, uh, the suspect's family, um, living so close by, it's... Um, you never thought of it. Police are promising to go through every single crevice of that house, Stephanie, before they finish with it sometime later this week. They're looking for any scrap of evidence to potentially tie Hewerman with other murder victims who were found on Gilgo Beach. Stephanie. Aaron Kutursky for us there in New York. Thank you so much. In Ohio, a police officer is under investigation for ordering a canine to attack an unarmed man who had already surrendered following a chase through three counties. The suspect reportedly called 911 during the pursuit, saying he was afraid to pull over. We do want to warn you that the video is disturbing for some viewers. Here's ABC's Alex Prashay with that story from Ohio. 
Do not release the dog. Tonight, a canine officer is under investigation and on paid leave after he appeared to command his dog to attack this unarmed black truck driver following a chase in Ohio. In body cam footage, a state trooper repeatedly warns an assisting local police officer not to release his dog on the man whose hands are up. Do not release the dog with his hands up. But that officer appears to signal for the dog to attack. Get the dog off of it! The 23-year-old driver, Jadarius Rose, given first aid and arrested. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Oh, Just let a dog bite you. And the trooper who warned against using the dog, baffled. Was that not loud enough? You said it three, four like miles a time. Authorities say it all started when the driver failed to pull over for a missing mud flap. Troopers chasing that semi for 26 miles, at one point ordering the driver out of the truck at gunpoint before he takes off again calling 911, telling a dispatcher he doesn't feel safe. I was about to comply with them, but they all had their guns drawn out for whatever reason. You need to pull over. You're going to get yourself in more trouble than what you're already in. I haven't even did it. I don't know why they're trying to kill me. Today, Circleville's mayor telling us that K-9 officer Ryan Speakman is now facing a review. It's an unfortunate situation, and we look to get it resolved very, very soon. The local NAACP saying that attack brought back horrible memories of dogs used on civil rights activists. It saddens me that in 2023, we have officers who are unleashing dogs. Our thanks to Alex Prochet for that report. Now to new details about the tragic and deadly boating accidents over the weekend. ABC's Ariel Reshev has the latest and what we're learning about those who lost their lives. I've lived here for a long time and I've never seen anything like this. Several communities across the country gripped by tragedy after a recent series of boating accidents that left two children dead and many more people injured. Getting a report, one head injury, people in the water, boat hit the jetty and launched all parties into the water. Authorities say 17-year-old high school student and star athlete Sadie Morrow was killed Saturday night in a crash on Cape Cod after the boat she was in hit a jetty, sending her and five others into the water. In South Carolina, the 11-year-old daughter of a former Major League Soccer goalie died after the boat carrying her family was rocked by the wake from another boat. The girls grieving parents telling ABC News everyone, including their daughter, was wearing a life vest and seated at the time of the collision, telling us their daughter Olivia was a beautiful soul, full of love, joy and faith. We know her light will continue to shine through others. And in Missouri, this staggering aftermath after officials say eight people were severely injured in the Ozarks when an intoxicated boat driver collided into this lakefront home. Two people sleeping in the home just a few feet away, the boat traveling 50 to 60 miles per hour. Last year alone, there were over 600 boating fatalities, and while causes may vary, alcohol continued to be the leading known contributing factor. If you're going to operate in a body of water at night, run that body of water during the day and establish what we call cookie crumb trails on your GPS or your chart plotter so that you can follow those at night and you know that it's good, safe water. So many tragic incidents over the weekend. Our thanks to Ariel. So we still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, what's left behind four months after a powerful tornado ripped through a Mississippi town. How the community is trying to support one another as they struggle with the devastating aftermath. But next, massive protests erupt in Israel. The new reform plan that has tens of thousands of demonstrators furious at the prime minister. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
Alaska. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Massive protests are raging in the streets of Israel where tens of thousands of demonstrators are furious over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's court reform plan passed by Israeli lawmakers today. The plan severely limits the Supreme Court's power to review government decisions with critics saying it threatens the country's democracy. The conflict in Sudan has officially reached its 100-day mark with no sign of coming to an end. According to the health minister, as of last month, the clashes have killed more than 3,000 people and wounded more than 6,000 others. The conflict derailed Sudanese hopes of restoring the country's fragile transition to democracy, which had begun after a popular uprising forced the military's removal of a longtime dictator back in April of 2019. And in Sweden, Greta Thunberg has been fined for disobeying police during an environmental protest at an oil facility last month. There she is. Hours after being fined by the Swedish court, Thunberg again tried to block access to the facility and was physically removed by police. The activist said the fight against fossil fuel industries was a form of self-defense due to climate crisis, saying we cannot save the world by playing by the rules. The court rejected her argument. She later vowed to journalists she would definitely not back down. It has been four months since a devastating tornado ripped through Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Soon after, we launched our Mississippi Strong initiative to spotlight the city as it gets back on its feet. And right now, the need there is greater than ever. Our Robin Roberts has more. The booming sound of demolition, the silence of a deserted downtown where businesses once thrived and a 100-foot-tall water tower still laying flat on its side. If you ain't never been through a tornado in your life, people don't know what you keep in your heart. You want to move forward in life on certain things, and you, you can't do it. This is the reality today in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, marking four months since a devastating EF4 tornado tore through the region. Rolling Fork taking a direct hit, upending the lives of the nearly 1,800 residents, killing 13 people throughout Sharkey County. Me and my siblings, we lost our mom due to the tornado. I don't know what to do right now. We need help. As the debris still lingers across the small town, so do the invisible injuries. We went through a devastating time, you know, and your mind, your mind is really just catching up with what, with what went on. To date, FEMA approving more than $5.2 million in disaster grants for Sharkey County. Recovery takes a long time, but when we look at that, there's been a lot of changes already. I'm seeing roofs going on, and people are rebuilding their homes. I'm watching temporary units being placed. But for many residents, including business owner Curtis Macon, progress <laughs> can't come fast enough. It's my iPad for my cash register. Yeah, it's emotional. As frustration against local leaders is mounting. Is at a standstill. We just want some answers, and we just want to move on to the next phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Concerned citizens recently taking to the streets after multiple canceled city board meetings. A key issue, the nearly 300 displaced residents still living in hotels in the surrounding area, with no clear timeline from city officials on when and how they will return home. For the ones that, that was winners and didn't have anything, you know, the ones that got displaced in motels, they're not doing anything. I'm ready to get out of Mississippi. 
Rolling Fork Mayor Eldridge Walker telling ABC News the city is working alongside FEMA to locate land for temporary housing and rebuilding the community as a whole will take time. This is an ongoing project. This is not a quick fix to what we're going through here in this community. I think we need to be a little bit more patient and understand that a build back for a community is going to take proper planning, strategic planning. That's our number one priority. Meanwhile, signs of hope emerge. A community-run initiative called Build Back Better, working to help renters become homeowners. We are building between 12 and 1,300 square foot homes. And a few businesses getting back up and running. The town, they need us here. People doing what they can to support each other. <laughs> like the South Delta High School football team, spending an afternoon clearing debris, finding purpose through pain. We may be in a storm right now, but the sun gonna shine in the morning. We gonna come back even better. So beautiful to see those clear signs of hope. Our thanks to Robin Roberts and her team for their dedication to that story. And still to come here on Prime, they survived one of the deadliest fires in the city's history. How a family's story of sorrow and tragedy is now turning to one of success and hope. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And finally tonight, a Philadelphia family who survived one of the deadliest fires in the city's history has turned sorrow into success. Now that one 14-year-old has his sights set on college and one college has their sights set on him. Reporter Becca Hendrickson from our partner station WPVI explains in our local lowdown. Oh, That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> ah, that was lit. In being a mom to four boys. Okay, that was nice, Chuck. Ty Harris Scott has no greater joy <laughs> than seeing her kids playing together at places like Lonnie Young Rec Center. On the ball. It's a family. This is just them having fun, though. She's fought so hard to save. Basically, it was just a whole bunch of screams, loud noise, stomping. It woke me up. It was January 2022. A fire ripped through a Fairmount Row home, killing 12 people, including nine children. The Scott family lived in the first floor apartment. Just one day at a time. We stayed close to each other. Tahera carried all her children to safety, the oldest of whom is 14-year-old Zachy e. Scott. I'm a good person, a hardworking person, and uh, I love my family. With his family's support, the teen is grasping what he calls a second chance at life. I got a chance to do special things. He made honor roll through middle school and is already turning heads on the football field where he plays linebacker. If he's not at the gym with his dad, he's at a training. It's not stop with him. Next month, Zach, he will start his freshman year at Imhotep Charter High School, where he'll focus on football and his STEM education. But his future is already secure beyond these next four years, thanks to a call from a Penn State coach. Amazing. Zaki, 
got an offer for a scholarship to play football at Penn State, a rare and exceptional honor for a 14-year-old. But if you ask his mom, he teach them so much. What makes her most proud is the example he's setting for his family. My dream for him, I just want him to be successful, do what he loves. What an inspiration. I think he'll do just fine. That is our show for tonight. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you all night long with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us as well on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on ABCNews.com. Have a great night.